Right, it's, uh, it's 7.31, so um, I will begin. Uh, welcome to you all tonight. Um, it's um, another one of those nights when aren't you glad you're on Zoom and not having to travel through uh, the wet streets of Lancaster. Um, so it's nice to see so many of you. Welcome to our speakers tonight. Um, Sue Black and, and Sarah, I've, I've stripped their titles off them, um, but they will get ample opportunity, uh, if they so wish, of telling you uh, what, you know, their business card is, is the, the size of a, a bookmark. So um, with all the letters after their names, so uh, <laughs> we'll leave them to, uh, We'll leave them to tell you about themselves uh, later, but I'll, I'll introduce them properly uh, in a few minutes. So I wanted to just update you on some of the things that are going on with the Civic Society and Lancaster Vision uh, at the moment. Many of you uh, are on the exec committee or members of Lancaster Vision and have been to those meetings, but there are quite a number of names that I can see up tonight. Uh, who would not. So um, if I can quickly go through a, a, a list of things that we're involved with at the moment, and I think the first one is Bailrig Garden Village. Um, we, um, Lancaster Vision supported that from the beginning, but um, at the meeting on Monday, um, there were a number of um, questions raised, a, a, a few misgivings, um, the latest update from the uh, consultants has included in the plans, in the maps, the added area that is, was only um, suggested at in the previous um, consultation document. They, they produced the original site, which runs down the west side of the A6, and then talked about an extension area heading west, further west towards um, Glasson. And in the documents that they've sent out now and that they brought up at their uh, pr presentation last week, those, that particular site was now marked in, in solid with showing um, development and the, the numbers of properties has increased to 5,000 from originally three, which then went to three and a half and has now gone to five. But it must be pointed out that that is talking about an extra development after 2031. But um, my view, personal view is that this development now is going to totally dominate Golgot. It is three times the area of Golgot. And I can understand why the people of Golgot are really concerned about this proposed development. Now we have put our points to the consultants. Um, James has prepared a statement raising our uh, issues and that uh, is either gone or is going uh, out to the tomorrow. Um, so that's where we are with that. The Green Plaques campaign um, has started off well uh, and is, well, it's gone viral. Um, we're getting... Um, an excellent response to the uh, choices of um, women uh, candidates for plaques. We've had suggestions made to us for extra people. Um, somebody came up with a member of the Cadbury uh, or married into the Cadbury family. Um, so um, that's uh, an interesting one. Um, and it's interesting to note that the RSPB um, the founder of which is a Lancaster woman and is on our list, RSPB have said that they are going to put a plaque up. 
So uh, we need to contact the RSPB, make sure that we're going to put one of our uh, heritage plaques up and that they'll pay for it. So um, we'll keep you posted on all that. It, it, it has led to an increase in applications for membership. Uh, David has been getting uh, new applications, including uh, one who think, I think paid with the application form. Um, so we're <laughs> there's, a, there's a, a side benefit uh, coming out of this. We've been involved um, in consultations regarding the Bay Unitary Authority, uh, and we have uh, put a response to the consultation um, which is being run from central government uh, on that. Uh, we, in principle, support the Bay Unitary Authority. Uh, Canal Quarter, uh, we've been invited to a consultation meeting at the town hall, uh, well, on Microsoft Teams, and um, Peter, myself and David are attending on behalf of um, Civic Society. Um, we've also been invited to a meeting with the Chamber and the Bids about a post-pandemic recovery plan. Uh, so we'll report back on that when that's happened. They, the Chamber passed on to us an RSPB document called Swift City. Uh, this is what mentions this memorial to um, the founder, but it's, it's to do with um, people making provision for uh, swifts, the bird uh, swifts, to nest. Um, they don't cause damage um, to properties, apparently, and they're encouraging us to um, help them uh, survive. We've been having a lot of discussion about uh, traffic, uh, mainly arising from plans being submitted by Hurstwood for expansion of the Loon Industrial Estate. Um, we are seriously concerned about the traffic. We're, we're concerned about the traffic today what the traffic would be like with an expanded industrial estate down there, the Lord only um, uh, can uh, contemplate. The, um, there is a suggestion from the uh, county that parts of the uh, ring road of Lancaster, the gyratory, should be made two-way. Now, you'd like to get that into your heads. Um, you may not sleep tonight. Um, we feel the only answer is a bridge, an extra bridge at the end of the quay going across to um, Saltaire and the uh, end of the Bay Gateway, the roundabout there. Um, it has been, uh, they've, they've turned their faces away from us, the county, but we are um, uh, planning a, a campaign uh, with the Chamber of Commerce. We, um, we're members of an organization called Civic Voice. Um, it's the umbrella organization for civic trusts and civic societies. Um, I attended a meeting along with Roger, in fact, um, uh, 10 days or so ago. Um, it was partly useful, partly depressing, uh, when it gets taken over by uh, civic societies who have had a total breakdown in relationships with their local authorities. I wrote to the civic voice saying this is not on because there are civic societies who have a good working relationship with the local authority. Um, and they've come back and invited us to do a presentation to them for their next meeting. So um, I've spoken to David about this and uh, we're proposing to do a presentation on the recent um, consultation seminar we did for the town hall for the housing strategy, which is a good example of us working well together with the local authority. 
the University of uh, or well, a, a student, I think, from the university it is, has written to us asking if our members would be interested in taking part in a survey. It's the impact of lockdown on people's mental health. Now, I know you might, some of you might think that um, I'd be a natural candidate for that, but um, the um, <laughs> The details will be put on the website and the contact details to get to this chap. It's all computer driven. Uh, there's no face to face. It's filling in a questionnaire. Uh, as I say, they've, they've asked for our assistance. So uh, I recommend that to you and the information will be on the uh, website in the next couple of days. Our speaker at the next meeting um, contacted us to say that um, she was a bit puzzled at the title we'd given her talk, um, as it grammatically didn't mean anything. So um, I can tell you that the title of next month's talk is The Lost Stories of St. George, Evidence from Medieval England. So, uh, wear your um, flags and um, you can wave them at the screen when um, she speaks. Um, but that's uh, Professor Sam Rich, who's, who's um, again at the university, um, about the lost stories of St. George. I promised her I would mention that tonight. So that's all the news you'll be relieved to hear uh, because I know you've not come to listen to me. Uh, I was sent the CV of Professor Dame Sue Black and Sarah Reese. She doesn't appear to have any. Are, are you a professor, Sarah? Shaking her hand, her head uh, rapidly. Uh, and I thought, well, if I start reading this lot out, um, most of you will have gone to catch the last bus before we get to the talk. So um, I will congratulate Sue on behalf of the uh, Civic Society for her uh, appointment to the House of Lords. Um, she's... Um, Unfortunately, I've got rid of my forelock, so I can't tug it. And looking at the screens here, there are not many others who've got forelocks either. Plenty. Um, uh, only David. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but we do congratulate you, uh, Sue. It's, uh, it's, it is an honour um, for you and for Lancaster um, that uh, your voice will be heard down there. Um, we hope you'll... Um, treat them to some uh, Lancashire common sense um, when you're talking to them. And <laughs> we wish you the best of, uh, of luck with, uh, with that role. Where on earth you'll find time in the midst of everything else that you appear to do, uh, I have no idea. Uh, now, Sarah uh, is responsible for uh, stakeholder relations. Um, I don't think that's anything to do with restaurants, um, but um, she, I have no doubt she will explain uh, what her role is, and, uh, and she leads um, the development and delivery of stakeholder engagement activities. I think I've said enough. Sue Black and Sarah Reese. Thank you. You're, you're so very kind. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen with you. Um, and I'm hoping that somebody will say, yes, we can see that when I, when I get it there. Okay. Yes, yeah. oh, perfect. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm now bathed in the most wonderful rose light. So um, how appropriate. I'm Sue Black and I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor for Engagement at Lancaster University and as Sarah will tell you she's the Head of Stakeholder Engagement and she's also the Civic Lead for the University. I'm a bit of a, a fraud in that in reality I am a Forensic Anthropologist by trade so that's my real job 
And also I'm an imposter because I come from north of the border, but I have to say that I, having been in Lancaster since 2018, I have felt incredibly welcomed and incredibly at home. So when I do get to the House of Lords, and quite frankly, I think somebody's made a big mistake there. I'm not sure if it's me or them, but when I get there, please be assured I intend to speak with a Lancaster voice as much as I intend to speak with anything else. What we want to do, Sarah and I, is we're going to separate this into, into two halves and I'm gonna take the first half and I'm just going to apologize to you uh, with no reservation, because I'm going to tell you a little bit about the history of the university. Now that makes me a real imposter because you know more about the history than ever I do. So you need to be kind to me. But the reason that I felt I tried to, I needed to try and understand the university was because of what Maya Angelou says, that you can't know where you're going if you don't know where you've been or where you've come from. And when I came into Lancaster in 2018, it was a brand new post, it didn't exist. And so being able to find my way and to try and understand where we could go, I felt it was extremely important to understand where we'd come from. So when you look to the past and you look to universities in the past, when you look, they separate out into quite clear categories. And at the top of that in the oldest groups are the ancients. And the ancients, of course, include Oxford and Cambridge, but how proud am I? Four out of the six are actually north of the border. And that tells you something about Scottish education of its time. I'm not saying it's necessarily carried on that way, but those are our ancients. Those are the universities that have been there since the 1200s and up into the 1500s. There was a period of almost 250 years before there was another university introduced in the UK. And they started to come in around the 19th century. And you can see what was happening in that time, moving up to Durham, so going a little bit north, coming down into London, looking at setting up of the universities in Ireland, but also the Victoria University, which doesn't exist anymore, and I'll come back to that, and a university in Wales. What we then started to see pre the First World War was what they talked about the first wave of civic universities. And they were called the red brick universities because many of them were built out of red bricks, which is where they got their name. And those red brick universities are Birmingham, Manchester and Liverpool, and they came out of the Victoria University, Leeds, Sheffield, Queens, Belfast and Bristol. And then we had a second wave of civic universities. And these are universities pretty much based within a city um, location, but not following uh, a college system because the original college systems were pretty much restricted to the ancients, although one or two have adopted it since. Sure, and that no, second true. wave of civic universities that came in was Reading, uh, Nottingham, Southampton, Hull, Exeter and Leicester. Out of those original universities, 22 of them survived. And then in the 1960s, what we had was an explosion of universities. 23 new universities were set up in the UK in the 1960s. And they were called plate glass or plates or glass ceiling sometimes universities. And that was to do with the architecture of the university. The fact that they were felt to be rather modern. And in those 1960s universities, you can see that Lancaster is within there. So that places us within our history. We're not an ancient, we're not a 19th century, we're not one of the first or the second civic waves. What we are is a response to post Second War Britain in relation to expansion of an educational capability. What happened was in 1947, so just after the Second World War, there was a public meeting, I believe, in Lancaster. And at that time, post-war, there was a recognition that we needed to invest in universities. Universities were going to help us to come out of the depression of the post-war. And if you think about coming out of difficult times, often it's to the universities that, that the government will look. What can you do to generate the economy of an area and increase it? What can you do to provide the skills pipeline for new people who are looking for new jobs or changing jobs? And it was just the same after the Second World War as we're starting to see again today. But 
just as you'd expect, and some things don't change. There was a lack of money, not surprisingly, after the Second World War. And that idea of a, a set of universities lapsed. But it was picked up again in 1961 by Lancashire County Council. And they proposed, led by Lord Derby, that there should be a university in the Northwest in Lancashire. And they put a proposal to the university's grant committee and that it was that Lancaster should be chosen as the site for that university. Now that was 1961 that that, that agreement was made. By 64 and the 14th of September, Her Majesty the Queen had approved the charter and the statutes for the university and our first 264 students were admitted in October of that year. Now that's a tremendous pace to be able to set up a university, to get courses up and running, to find 264 students that wanted to come to Lancaster anyway, but also it was an ab initio university, which meant that we were able to confer our own degrees. We didn't have to rely on another university. What you can achieve when you have to, when there's a little bit of government funding behind you, can be amazing. And that's something that Sarah is going to come back to a little bit later on, I'm sure. Our first chancellor, and she was our chancellor for 40 years, was Princess Alexandra. And our first vice chancellor was Sir Charles Carter. So it's important to know how we came about and who was there. This is, uh, so I've had so much fun going through photographs. Lancaster train station, this is what it would have looked like when our students arrived in the 1960s. Now the train might be a bit different, but you know, the station has changed so little, I even knew which side of the platform I was on. So that it's very recognizable. And Madame Tussauds, of course, had an ex exhibition going on in Morecambe at the time. And this is what our students would have seen, probably their first introduction to Lancaster. We weren't quite ready for them, but what we had done is we'd placed a number of areas where we would do a lot of our teaching and our accommodation around different parts of the city, because what we didn't have was a campus. And so we begged and borrowed, didn't steal, but begged and borrowed and were given a number of properties where we could set up lecture rooms. For example, we borrowed the Grand, that we could set up teaching areas, recreational areas, and a lot of our students lived in accommodation in Morecambe. The library was up towards Castle Hill. And that's never ideal for a university when you're separated across a wide area of geography. And it was never intended that it was going to be a long-term situation. It was a stopgap whilst we could build a purpose-built university. And that happened and the work started on that in 1963 out at Bailrig, when Lancaster City Council um, donated a, the tract of land to the university, specifically to build the university on that site. The rationale, I believe, was that it was on top of a hill, so it would be easily seen and be a landmark. And they, I believe the architects designed it so that it would look like a Mediterranean town. Can I just say, I'm not overly convinced that their vision was convincing, but that explains the very sort of uneven profile that you have, I think, on the tops of the buildings. That tract of land came to the university in 63. By 65, we'd started to work on the campus. And it was only a year later that we opened the first buildings, buildings that were teaching based and that were administration based. And we moved out of the city gradually between 1966 and 1970. By 1970, we had largely vacated Lancaster City and moved out onto the purpose built campus on the tract of land that had been given to us by the city council. When the university was founded, it had a number of clauses in our founding charter. And one of those clauses was really important and it was the third of those. And it stated what the university should be, that the objects of the university should be to advance knowledge, wisdom and understanding by teaching and research and by the example and influence of its corporate life. So there were three distinct pillars in wh on which the university was founded. It's research, it's teaching, and the example that it led in its corporate life. 
And when I first came to the university, they had just refreshed the strategy that was going to take the university to 2020. Nobody envisaged what 2020 was going to look like. It turned out to be very different, I suspect, to what our strategy had ever anticipated. But we still had three pillars. And those three pillars in the strategy were research that changes practice and thinking, teaching that transforms people's lives and society, and to engage actively with students, businesses, and our communities. And that to me was really important. This showed a longevity. It showed a stability in a university who knew from the outset what its job was. And in 2020, 50 odd years later, it was still holding to those principles. That was what the university needed to be. So in 2018, the university created a new post, which was a pro vice chancellor for engagement. And if I was being perfectly honest, I don't think the university knew what that meant. Um, and I arrived in a job not really certain what they wanted, which was great because it gave me a bit of free reign. And I had people like Sarah alongside me who had been so steeped in the work of the university and its engagement activities for so long that she could tell me who I needed to talk to and who I didn't need to talk to and when that should happen. And it's great to have somebody who has that level of experience with you. But what I want to do is I want to share just for a moment with you my journey and bearing in mind all I knew about Lancaster was that the train went through it because I'd gone down the West Coast line <coughs> and I'd shot through it on occasion. I knew when I sat in my previous university, every time we looked at league tables, Lancaster was ahead of everybody else. And we used to keep saying, what do they do there? What is it that's in the water in Lancaster? that makes that such a successful university. And so when the post came up, I was enticed to come down. And I arrived in Lancaster train station to see that sign. And I thought, you know, that's really encouraging because that means that it's a university and a town that understand each other. And I'd come from a university, wait, wait for the punchline. I'd come from the university where town and gown were so close, you couldn't get a cigarette paper between them if you tried. And I made the incorrect assumption that Lancaster University and Lancaster City would be the same. And I looked at the logo and I thought I understood the history of that. There's the lion, that's about the duchy, that's about the sovereignty. I knew that the roses were about, I'd heard of the Wars of the Roses, so I knew that it was a much more important coloured rose than the other one, which lost. I knew that that red was important. I knew the wavy line was about a river and that river was important to a history. And I also knew that the book was about learning. I knew the red was Lancaster. I knew the grey um, was a harp back to the Quaker origins of some of the principles of the university. So I felt I came into Lancaster that day on the train station, knowing what I was getting into. Well, then what you do standing outside the station is you get into a taxi. And I have what I call the taxi driver test that says when you get into a taxi, if you ask the right question, then a taxi driver will know that you're a captive audience from the moment you get in till the moment you get out and they can talk at you for however long that takes. And I asked the taxi driver, what's the relationship like between Lancaster University and Lancaster City? And I'm going to tell you what he told me. What he said to me was, oh yeah, the university, it's not in Lancaster, it's outside Lancaster. And I thought, well, that's interesting because the, the sign tells me it's the home of Lancaster. But this taxi driver is telling me there's a distance. And then what he said to me was, it's up on a hill. And up on a hill, what that tells you is that people are removed. So it told me not only was there a geographical distance problem, but it told me there was a perception distance problem as well. And he said, I don't know what they do up there. That worried me because I kind of hoped that the city would know what the university was doing. He said, but they're awfully clever folk. Well, I thought, well, that's a good start. At least there's some academics in there that are smart. And then he said something that worried me more than anything. He said, but you know what? They've got a shed load of money. 
And I thought, I'll bet they don't, because I've looked at their figures and I wouldn't be coming for the PVC role here if I didn't understand the figures. So there was this perception of a university that was outside the city. It was up on a hill and removed. Somebody who didn't know what went on there, but they were a source of going to for funds. And I'll bet they were disappointed many times if they went to the university for funds. And so when I did the interview at the university, what I said to them was, this is what the taxi driver told me. And I have to say it was a fairly uncomfortable uh, in interview because I decided that I didn't need a job and I was going to go in with all guns blazing like I was a destroyer heading out to sea. And if I terrified the living daylights out of them, they wouldn't have given me the job anyway. But if they were up for the battle and they were up for recovering ground, then they'd offer me the job. And they did. And when they offered it to me, I couldn't turn it down. And I've not regretted a single moment in accepting that post because I have had the most wonderful journey getting to know Lancaster University and getting to know the city that it really should belong to. And I had a moment, and I won't, I won't say who it was that said it to me, but when, you know, I've been battling at various committees, and I think I'm on just about every committee you can get on in Lancaster. Um, and often, you know, you get a fair bit of flack about the university. And when COVID hit, it was one of my, um, my biggest, um, questioners who turned to me and said well Lancaster is a university town and I thought yes it is and we've seen when we hit COVID when we don't have our students when we can't do the things that we want to do what the effect of that is and that's what we need to build on and Sarah's going to give you some fantastic examples of the kinds of things that we've been doing in the last two years. When I got up onto main campus, this is what the university told me. We're a triple top 10 UK university, university of the year in 2018, best accommodation in 2019, one of the last eight, eight times in the last decade. 2020, we became international university of the year and third in the UK for graduate employment. That is really, really unusual. And I don't know of any other university in the UK where you have a university of that pedigree that is not in a major urban conurbation. And that's what makes Lancaster different. Huge success at a national level and an international level. And some might argue by being put up on that hill, what the university was able to do was to look across the horizon and look at its national involvement and its international involvement. And maybe what that taxi driver was telling me is that enough attention wasn't placed in the locality and in the region. Where we are in a particularly useful position in Lancaster and in the region is to have a university of this standing because that means we can facilitate tremendous amount of opportunities for the region. I don't believe Lancaster has used the university particularly well, and I don't think Lancashire has used the, the university particularly well, but then I don't think the university necessarily put itself forward into that local and that regional area. Very happy for you to disagree with me. These are just my personal uh, perspectives as I would say from the North, as an inner bookcomer, somebody who doesn't belong, but comes in and sees what they see. So what we started to do and what we started to do for the future, and these are some of the things, and, and you know, please don't worry about all of these words, is we're starting to draft our strategy of what we're going to look like as a university going into 2025. And we're looking at our vision and in our vision, we're very much focused as much on our local and our regional as we are on our national and our international. That drives our purpose and it drives our values. So there is a shift. There is unquestionably a shift in direction that's coming at the university's directive. And one of the first things we did in 2018, and Sarah has been unquestionably the driving force behind this, is signing the university's civic universities agreement that says 
if you are an anchor institution in your community, if you genuinely are, if you closed your doors, your community would notice. And I think everybody would agree if Lancaster University closed its doors, we're not, by the way, just in case anybody thinks that, if we were to close our doors, the effect that would have locally and regionally is important. And that says that as a business, you have a responsibility, not only to your own business and to your own staff, but to the community in which you're embedded, because that community is your own staff and your own students and your own colleagues and your own friends as well. So I hope you'll agree that it's, it, you know, the tanker takes a while to change direction, but I hope you're going to agree that, that we are changing that direction. And we have those three strategic priorities. They haven't changed and they haven't changed because they're important and they're right for what we do. It's about research that transforms practice and thinking, whether it's happening locally, regionally, nationally or, national, or internationally, teaching and learning that transforms people's lives and engaging actively with our communities, whatever that community is, to transform our wider society. And so what I'm going to ask Sarah to do now is to take over. I'm going to try and run the slides for her. So she's going to quickly realize that I'm totally incompetent when it comes to doing any kind of technical work behind the scenes. So please just shout at me, Sarah, when you want me to change a slide. And if I can hand over to you, I'd be very grateful. Thank you, Sue. So we'll do the Chris Whitty approach, won't we? Next slide, please, but not yet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I know a number of you um, who are here in the room, but I'm Sarah Reese. I was before Sarah Rowe. Um, so I know a, few, a couple of people sort of realised there was still the same person. Um, I'm head of stakeholder relations at the university, which sounds a bit grand, uh, but what it really is, is that relations part. It's about building relationships um, and that's uh, locally, nationally um, and, and regionally as well. Um, and it's really also, I have a real focus around our civic and our community engagement. Um, so as Sue's just said, engagement is there in our strategy. It's, it's our third priority alongside research and teaching. And that's a strategic commitment to engage with our communities. And that's locally, nationally and globally. And that's really about creating positive economic, cultural and societal change. And I think going back to what just Sue just said, actually, about how we're shifting the dial on some of this. Actually, this is starting to reflect in the values that are going to be part of our strategy going forward, that, that point about creating change together. And for me, the really important word in that sentence is with. We'll engage with our communities. We work together. Um, it's not about, dare I say it, being on the hill. Um, it is about working together and also um, about being part of the place from which we take our name. Um, so Sue just talked briefly um, about the Civic University Network and, and what that means a little bit. Um, and, and it's particularly about how we work with our civic partners, so local authorities, with, with health partners um, and with colleges and education to really develop that civic approach and understand the needs of, of our place um, and agree how we can work together to address those needs. But importantly, that we'll know if we've made a difference as well, so we, we know what outcomes we're heading for. And that's really grounded in, in working with our partners and our communities and how we harness those other two parts of our mission, our research and our education, um, so that we can contribute and work together to bring about the change that we all want to see. Um, so I'm just going to spend a bit of time this evening highlighting some of the ways in which we're doing that. I'll miss things and I apologise there'll be people here who are working with us in other ways, so I'm sorry if I've missed your activity. It does reflect there's a lot going on, but I don't think we always tell that story very well. So I've tried to capture that a little bit this evening. So Sue, next slide please. Thank you. Well, first of all, as Sue's just said um, uh, very well, the university is part of the Lancaster district. And so, of course, Lancaster City Council, which is the, the local authority for the district, is an incredibly important partner for us. Um, and there are many, many interactions between the university, colleagues at the university and colleagues at the council every week. And we're always finding out about new things. Um, but there are far too many to mention. So I've just drawn out a few examples this evening. Um, last year, the 
university contributed to uh, Lancaster District People's Jewellery. Uh, we had representation as part of the steering group, but importantly, a number of our environmental scientists contributed as commentators to help the jurors to get to grips with the challenges around climate emergency and some of the decisions that they might make and the things they might prioritise as part of the action plan going forward. In a different area completely, the university is a partner on the Heritage Action Zone project, um, which is about enhancing the, the historic character around St Leonard's Gate and the Grand Theatre, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with that. Um, and we'll be particularly supporting that um, through the community engagement element of it. Um, as Sue mentioned, it's actually where we started all those years ago, so it's really great to be part of a project that's actually about how we regenerate and, and um, restore that area. Um, in a completely different way, uh, colleagues from our management school and our enterprise team have been working with the economic regeneration team at the council to support business recovery from COVID-19. And that's both through diagnosing, diagnostics around what, what can be done differently, and also access to support for recovery and, and resilience. And the university is also a member of the Communities Togethers group, which is led by the council, of course, and brings together representatives from ethnic, faith and other social groups to collaborate in creating diversity and resolving local issues. Next slide, please, Sue. Thank you. We've always worked closely with the NHS and that's locally and regionally and nationally. And that's across all of our activities as well, our research, our education, and also the work of our students. Since 2006, many of you will know, we've been working um, across the region to deliver medical degrees through Lancaster Medical School. And that's helping to train and retain doctors um, in the region, uh, both in GP community practice and in the acute hospitals as well. Because there's a lot of evidence which says that if you train in an area, you're more likely to stay there as a doctor. And that has been really important in terms of developing the workforce. And it was really pleasing that in 2019, we actually doubled the number of students who are studying with us um, as part of the national expansion of, of medical um, medical student numbers and some of you again may know but last year our medical students along with um, many others around the country graduated early so that they could join the national NHS response to the pandemic. We've also built on a lot of those relationships that previously existed over the last year during the pandemic and particularly we've been working with the University Hospitals of Morecambe Bay Trust and that's been about sharing our resources and facilities. So quite early on in the pandemic we set up a joint Covid testing lab on campus and that was staffed by um, colleagues from both the Trust and our own researchers as well. Um, we've been we're currently trialling a new rapid COVID-19 test that's being trialled at the hospital. Um, and during the pandemic, our engineering department manufactured items for use on the wards and in PPE as well. And more recently, we've been working with Lancaster Medical Practice to host the vaccination clinic um, in the new Health Innovation One building on campus. Some of you may have visited it. I'm, I'm reliably told that as of Monday, 17 and a half thousand people have received their vaccines in the building, which is fantastic. And that Health Innovation Campus is really important as well, because that's part of how we can work going forward with businesses, with healthcare professionals and policymakers to improve health and also support regional growth and investment. Next slide, please, Sue. As you know, Lancaster has a long history of supporting education provision across the whole region. Historically, of course, we validated degrees for St Martin's College, which is now part of the University of Cumbria, and also Edge Hill University. And of course, many of those graduates have gone on to become the nurses and the teachers and the allied healthcare professionals that are working across, across the area. Um, and incidentally, I actually helped to organise quite a lot of their graduation ceremonies in my early time at Lancaster. Um, we've also had long-standing relationships with Blackpool and Blackburn Colleges, and also with Furness College in Barrow. But what you'll notice from that list is that Lancaster and Morecambe College was missing. And I think back to Sue's point that we haven't always been focused on our immediate place. Um, I think that's one of those examples of that. But we're really pleased that over the last three years, particularly Sue, since, since Sue arrived, that relationship with the college has really developed and with Wes Johnson and his team. And last summer we signed a memorandum of understanding with the college to work together to enhance educational provision, provide pathways to employment through apprenticeships and work placements and support economic regeneration. 
And more recently, as part of the wider Plans for Eden Project North, we're working with the college, with Eden Project International, and with other schools and colleges in the area, as well as health and community partners and businesses to develop the place-based Morecambe Bay curriculum. And some of you may have attended some of the talks that have taken place on that over the last couple of months. And the curriculum is going to be supporting learning through from early years to higher education. And the aim is to provide the skills and knowledge which are needed by regional employers. Um, and hopefully that includes Eden Project North. And it's been through all those relationships with the colleges, with the schools and the links with the City Council that the Connecting Kids project came about to help connect vulnerable children with education during the first lockdown in 2020. Over £130,000 was raised through the university's fundraising team to support that project and that's included the provision of 500 laptops, of internet access, over 2000 activity packs and learning resources and mentoring support to pupils across the area. And what's been great, uh, uh, you've probably seen the Laptop for Kids initiative, which has followed on and which is being um, led through by, by parents from the area. Um, and it's been really good to see how that's continued. Next one, please, Sue. As Sue said, our strategy says that we will engage with our communities. And for the last few years, we've been trying to do that more actively. Um, so we've been really proud to, to support some of the local community festivals. Um, so like, like Lancaster, Morecambe Carnival and Pride, um, which obviously we're all hoping will be able to take place again later this year. Um, and that's both as a partner and a sponsor. And we have just recently agreed we, we will support Lan Light at Lancaster again in 2021. And as well as um, supporting those really vibrant community festivals, there have also been opportunities to share our research with the community and give them opportunities to get involved. And of course, we also do that via our public events programme through public lectures and campus in the city. And we've recently relaunched the public lectures online and expanded the programme. So we've got academics talking about the different ways that they've responded to COVID-19. But as well as telling you about our research, because that's a bit easy talking at you and telling you things, um, we've also been trying to provide more ways to hear from you about what you think we should be doing. So in 2019, we launched the Lancaster Exchange as an interactive forum, which is open to the whole community. And the next one is due to take place on the 13th of May. Um, and uh, the information about that will be going out really shortly. And we also hosted a community consultation on our new strategy back in December. And I, I hope many of you took the opportunity to come. I certainly recognize some names um, from, from those who were there. Our students are also engaging with the community as part of their studies and as volunteers. Um, I've drawn out the example of the Law Clinic, which is a student-led clinic providing free legal advice um, on a range of legal issues. And over 400 of our students in a normal year volunteer in the community, for example, in schools, as classroom assistants, on summer activity programmes and environmental projects. And of course, through their actual academic studies through some of the projects they do and the placements that they have, they're actually working with local businesses and with uh, charities and, and third sector organisations on particular challenges um, to actually make a difference there too. Thank you, Sue. I've also just pulled together a few examples of some of the ways um, in which our research is contribution, contributing to finding local solutions. Um, and again, there's lots of overlap between the partners that we're working with and some of the difference that it's making. And actually in his introduction, John commented on um, a couple of people who, um, somebody who's speaking at the next event, who of course is from the university, um, and also a piece of research that's come out around the impact of lockdown on, on mental health, asking you to participate in that. And that's very much about how we, how we engage with you and that informs our research and shapes the kind of advice that we can then bring forward to inform policy. Um, so just a few examples here. Uh, last summer our School of Architecture worked with the council in the story to uh, develop an automated social distancing and wayfinding model and that was to support businesses with planning for reopening after the first lockdown. We've got a major beyond imagination research project, which has got many facets to it, but one of those um, is going to be working to undertake a survey of 3000 residents uh, from across Lancaster and Morecambe and Blackburn. Um, and that's looking at lifestyle, sustainability, transport, and this is to help to inform future planning and decision making for the district. Researchers from Lancaster Environment Centre have contributed to the development of the um, 
Lancaster District Food Poverty Alliance's five-year action plan. That's quite a mouthful. Um, and, uh, and we've also got sociologists who are working um, with communities in the area, drawing on their experience of people with lived experience um, as part of things like the Morecambe Bay Poverty Truth Commission um, and to inform a digital inclusion strategy for the district. As I say, there'll be many other examples. So this is just a snapshot. Um, next slide, please, Sue. Thank you. And of course, part of the role of the university is, it, you know, to, to bring that economic um, sort of activity that we have and to try to make a difference across the region. Um, so we work with the local enterprise partnerships with the local authorities and business to help to drive economic regeneration and access government funding for regional development. Um, as part of the government's town deals project, there have been two successful projects that we're partners on. So one is with Barrow Borough Council, um, and that's to develop an HE centre in the centre of Barrow in partnership with the University of Cumbria and with Furness College in Barrow, as well as a range of other partners. And at the south of the county in Blackpool, um, we're working with uh, Blackpool and Fylde College and the council to develop a multiversity, which will bring together a range of services, including education for the whole community. The university is also playing a role in the Net Zero North agenda, which is being developed by something called the N8 partnership, which is a partnership of the eight research intensive universities in the north. And this is aiming to establish a 300 million pound research, innovation and skills program focused on research and development collaborations between universities and industry. And that's to drive the green recovery for the north and thinking about both business and skills development. And Lancaster is also leading the £7 million EcoI Northwest project, which is around developing products, processes and services um, to, to bring clean and sustainable growth products to market. And that's supporting hundreds of SMEs. Um, and there's, there's a whole range of other programmes sitting alongside this in cybersecurity and advanced, advanced manufacturing. And of course, in Lancaster, Sue's already talked about um, some of the ways we work in Lancaster. We work with Lancaster Bid and with the Chamber of Commerce to support a thriving business community and city centre and really think about how, again, how we can um, bring student experience in, in to support that. Next slide, please, Sue. But to bring it all together, I just wanted to finish with Eden Project North because I think this exemplifies what can hopefully be achieved when the energy and commitment of a range of partners, sectors and the whole community all pulling together and come together behind an incredible project. And we've been working hard along with the other founding partners at the City Council, the County Council and Lancashire Local Enterprise Partnership, as well as, of course, with Eden Project International to get this over the line and secure the government funding, hopefully <laughs> everything crossed, to make it a reality. Because it's not just a local visitor attraction, although a very fine tourist attraction, it would certainly be. It's there, it's going to raise aspirations and create opportunities for the whole community in education, in health and well-being. It'll create jobs and new business. And that's all underpinned by a commitment to sustainability. So that potential runs through everything we do at the university and so many of the things we've talked about already this evening through our research and a whole range of disciplines, through our education and our enterprise and our engagement, the development of the Morecambe Bay curriculum, initiatives like Net Zero North and those sustainable businesses, and also as a physical base for sharing our research and engaging with our communities and all those visitors who come from all over the world. So along with all the other partners and as part of our civic role, we want to ensure the impact of that project extends well beyond that initial investment and build to make a lasting difference to the lives and economy of the whole region. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Um, at that point, we just wanted to, to come to a, a close and leave a little time for you for questions if you might have them. And I'll stop sharing if, if everyone's OK with that, because it takes away some of the glare and, and open ourselves up to any questions that you might have. We'll do our best. We probably can't answer everything, but we'll have a go. Thank you, Sue. Um, right. Uh, if, as I said at the beginning, if you could use the reactions um, tool at the bottom of your screen and put your hand up as Roger has done um, for a question and at that point uh, when you're, you're chosen if you could then unmute yourself Roger 
Yeah, could I ask why the University Court, which was an annual event which involved people from all different levels of society in Lancaster, why was that stopped? So that was before my time, um, so I'm going to pass that to Sarah because I would be giving you information that I've heard from elsewhere without necessarily having all the facts to my to my fingertips, Sarah. Thank you. Well, I think there's two there's two answers actually. So one is that um, it was partly to do with what the purpose of the court was in strictly governance terms from the university perspective in terms of the role that it had. And actually, um, in, in terms of how university governance has changed and not specifically Lancaster, but more widely, um, it, it was no longer um, actually serving the need that, or the purpose that it had as, as a governance um, point. But more importantly, although it was was open to people it was actually um, a closed invitation list in that you were only invited if you were a member of court so there were many types of organizations as well as the local community in general who didn't have the opportunity and because that court meeting effectively was our annual general meeting it meant that we actually didn't have an open forum when actually people could come and ask questions of the university and contribute to, to the way the university was heading and that's actually why we replaced it with the Lancaster Exchange because we wanted something that was actually very much open to all, that we work really hard to promote as, as widely as we can, um, and that's actually interactive. So we don't just give you a load of presentations about what the university is doing, but we actually try and create opportunities for conversation and discussion um, to hear, and which is why I particularly did want to mention it this evening, because it's coming up quite soon, and, and I know it's of interest to a number of people. So that, that's the background, I think, to why we moved away from court and, and towards the Lancaster Exchange. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Claire and David had a hand up. Did um, have you? Roy, you've disappeared. And Andrew has got his hand up. Um, Andrew Dennis. Andrew. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the presentation. Uh, just building on your uh, strategic objective, I think it was about international and international standing. Do you talk a little bit about the role of uh, attracting international students into the area and some thoughts perhaps on how well integrated they, they might be? I'm talking to somebody who lives relatively central in Lancaster and see the, the new student blocks going up and worry a little bit about them becoming kind of islands of student life in the midst of the rest of the community. Thanks. Yes. Uh, and, and we share your concerns about student accommodation that goes up in the city. And can I say that the vast majority of those are not driven by the university. Um, as you know, we have a lot of student accommodation on campus. Um, that arose largely because of the development of the campus on the site that it's on. It took a lot of our students away from Morecambe, which I think at the time possibly caused a lot of problems as well. But it does mean that all of our first years, or pretty much all of our first years, get an opportunity to be on campus. And being on campus for the first year gives them, if they are international students, that opportunity to integrate for a year, because it can be quite a strange and challenging thing to come from a different country to a different county, country, county, and perhaps, you know, a different part of the world where, where traditions and just ways of operating are different. If they can spend that year on campus, then you do get a greater sense of integration and belonging. Normally what happens then after first year is that many of our students want to get away from campus and they want to go and learn what it feels like to live in the city and have more of the city life. And we tend to see that our second years and our third years in particular tend to go out into the city. And by that point, after having had a first year in the university, they are a bit more acclimatised, not just to the weather, but to the area as well. And what we find with our students is the incredible fondness that they have for Lancaster and for Lancashire by the time they've been here for three years. They talk about kindness, they talk about acceptance. And what they then do is they go away and they tell their friends. And often the best recruitment that any university can do overseas is by word of mouth. And so our success in many ways through word of mouth is a direct result of the welcome that our students get when they come into the city. 
And that to me is just such a tremendous thing to celebrate. Now we are looking as a university uh, in a post COVID situation, what should our balance of students be in terms of national and international? Where do those students come from? We haven't got any direct answers at the moment, but what I can say to you is the university is not planning any massive expansion at this time. What we're looking at doing is consolidating our position. And if we grow, we will grow organically, but we're not looking to grow at any form of an exponential rate. But part of our own success and our international students is thanks to the Northwest, quite frankly. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, you had your, Andrew Riley, you had your hand up. Yeah, uh, going back to the, the exchange meetings, I, um, I, I brought up in um, in one of those about the popularity of the campus in the city and how well attended it was, but the fact that it was only on for a short period of time. Um, I did suggest at the exchange meeting, has there been any consideration into actually looking for a permanent venue in town? So, so there's a city centre link for the oh. people of Lancaster. Sorry, you could have like you know constant um, exhibitions and things like that. But there'd be somewhere for you know for the local people to go as a resource, um, to, to, you know, to be used for the city. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let Sarah come in on the campus and the city bit because she is she is the the brain behind the campus and the city. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do very early on in coming into Lancaster was to try and bring the university back into the city. And in the first steps of that, what we did was we've taken over some of the renovated space at the castle. So we have some teaching rooms now at the castle. Um, we're in discussion, as we always are, in relation to developments around Lancaster, but particularly around the Canal Quarter, for example, which would be a great area for the University of Sarah said to come back into the area where it started. What we don't have are any, any concrete plans, but we are in discussion because we do want to reduce that distance between the University at Bale Rig and Lancaster in the city. But I think that the science, um, the science in the campus, campus in the city, sorry, Sarah, campus in the city um, was a tremendous success and I've had great fun going to those. But you can talk about that much more eloquently than I can, Sarah. Thank you. Um, so uh, we know it would be great to roll it out for more of the year to have uh, more opportunities. Um, and, and obviously you'll have noticed it hasn't run for a couple of years. Now, obviously uh, last year, this year in particular, that, that was for obvious reasons. Last year, unfortunately, it, it just couldn't take place, but I am hoping it will return next year. Um, interestingly for me, one of the things, and this comes back to how we engage with our communities, is actually about to what extent we set up ourselves in one place in the centre of Lancaster City and expect everyone to come to us and to what extent actually we recognise that um, the district is Lancaster and Morecambe um, and that our communities are in lots of different places around there and that actually if we really want to work with our communities and um, find opportunities for, for communities to find out more about what we do and to find ways in then we need to go there a bit more um, so and there's lots of examples of that there's stuff like doing science in the pub for example you know it, it doesn't have to be in a shop um, and so one of the things I have slightly set the challenge on to my team is actually how could we rethink this how can we do this differently and I think the other important thing for me is that when we do that we really work as equals with our partners and um, so you know we think about what does it cost to be in that space how can we support that how do we work together um, so so I think what I'd say is watch this space I certainly expect it to return in some form I also want to see that kind of activity being integrated in things like light up Lancaster and Morecambe Carnival hopefully um, um, and those other opportunities where different parts of the community come together and who wouldn't necessarily think campus in the city is for them. So, um, so that's a bit of a long winded answer, but hopefully sort of moves in the direction um, and covers your point. Uh, and I did forget, we also have space that we use in the story for our students. And we, we, if you go drive past Lancaster and Morecambe College, we're really proud that our logo is now on their front gate because we do have space in Lancaster and Morecambe College as well. And hopefully you're going to see us in Morecambe not, not, not if, but when. 
um, Eden Project North uh, arises. So, so there are there are these plans, but what the university, I think you also have to understand, is a little bit careful about is not bulldozing its way in. We've, we've got to make yeah. sure that what we're doing is the right thing in the right place for the right reasons. And that's why we're open to discussion with everybody and anybody who'll talk to us. Sarah will tell you, I will drink as much coffee as you can produce, <laughs> providing you bring a bit of cake with you, then we are, we are there to talk about opportunities and what we can do together. That's brilliant, thank you. You're thank you. welcome. Um, James has his hand up, James yeah. Wood. James? Thank you. Um, in a small city like Lancaster, it's quite unusual that we have two universities in a way, obviously Lancaster University, but also uh, Sarah referred to the former St. Martin's College, now a campus of the University of Cumbria. And in terms of integrating our outreach work, um, I just wonder whether there are opportunities for us to um, coordinate so that we're not tripping over each other in what we're doing in the city and even to collaborate with the University of Cumbria in some of our activities and engagements. So, so we do. Um, and I, I've known Julie Menel, um, who's the Vice Chancellor at Cumbria for many, many years in a previous life when we were both in the forensic science world. So it's a very, very small world. So Julie was one of the first people that I, I went to meet. And what I found is that when you look at our, our further education colleges and our universities, certainly when you're in, in the north of Lancashire, there is actually very little competition, but a huge amount of complementarity. So that means that when you don't have any commercial competition, but you have strengths that they have that we don't and vice versa, then that complementarity is just waiting to be exploited. And the classic thing was Lancaster and Morecambe College with whom we had no relationship before, but now with them, um, we, we've seen tremendous leaps forward. We're working with Cumbria on a number of projects up in Carlisle, but also over in Barrow, but also we're looking, for example, at working with them jointly about student mental health and well-being. Because why would you have two universities trying to address the same problem when if we come together, we might be able to address it collectively? So I can honestly say with my hand on my heart that the relationship that we have between our further education colleges and the complementary higher education institutions is incredibly positive. And I've not met any hesitation or reticence in any way of working together, which I, I think is incredibly unusual. And what we did do, because um, the Department for Education gave Lancaster University the responsibility for being the point for coordination during COVID for the educational institutions. And what Sarah and I did was we brought together for the first time ever, all of the further education colleges and universities in Lancashire. They'd never worked on a project collectively together. And I have to say it was a joy. It was an absolute joy what we were able to show collectively we could do. Now out of that, because I, I, I really, um, you should never give me an inch, because if you give me an inch, I'm going to take a mile wherever there's an opportunity. When we brought them together, it gave us the opportunity for Lancashire to be able to make a bid for an Institute of Technology so that we could bring all of the further education colleges supported by the universities to bring some more government investment into the area. And our fingers are still crossed that we'll get through to the second stage of that. But that partnership came about through the willingness of people to come together. And I don't think it's because they weren't willing before, it's just because they hadn't been brought into the same room. And as I say, Sarah and I like to talk just in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Thank you. You're so welcome, James. I noticed in the chat that some that Amy has said we have a student on the Civic Society com Committee. Yes, uh, Amy, I know that. Thank you very much. Don't worry, we have you clocked. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody needs to keep an eye on her. Um, yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, Michael. No? Michael Gibson has his. Oh, that's no, thumbs up. Sorry. I've got Cla it Claire was a and question, David down there, yeah. and I'll come. I'll come to you, Michael, after uh, okay. after this one. Claire and David, you've got your hand up. One of the most 
uh, I think, successful examples of engagement in local community was the Department of the Continuing Education, uh, uh, which was very busy. And unfortunately, the plug was pulled on it 10, 15 years ago. I think just for financial reasons, it wasn't making a profit. Uh, I note that there are sub universities in the UK still have active departments of continuing education or outreach. Uh, and they may perhaps not be quite so bothered about the bottom line as Lancaster University was in those days. I think it'd be wonderful if the Department of Continuing Education could be reinvented uh, and they uh, start having very successful courses again, which they had in the past, uh, which were open to everybody to sign on for. And it wasn't just Lancaster Morecambe, they came from a long way away in the Northwest. Thank you. Thank you. Well, well, I have I have an idea. I have a plan. This is the point at which Sarah thinks, oh my goodness me, what the hell is she going to say? <laughs> is that um, with the Morecambe Bay curriculum, the Morecambe Bay curriculum is a 25 year curriculum and it goes from birth to 25 years of age, because if you are going to break an educational poverty cycle, then you need to take a generation and more. But that's just the first bit of it. The second bit of it is what happens beyond those 25 years when we have individuals who want to reskill, upskill, that's where our relationship, particularly with Lancaster and Morecambe College, is really strong. And then when you get a significant number of people who want to retire, but have got so many incredible talents to be able to share, how do you bring those three sectors together? How do you bring together the zero to 25 Morecambe Bay curriculum, the 25 till, let's say, wouldn't it be wonder, we all, wonderful, we all retire at 65, but the, the 25 to 65 group, and then the 65 plus. If you can across that continuing education um, spectrum, actually cross the boundaries between them, so there isn't a boundary, then I think that gives us the most wonderful opportunity for what we could do for education and lifelong learning and education in the region. And I think our further education college and our universities and our communities are up for that. I know I've talked about cake, but what I mean by cake is sometimes you just have to eat it slice by slice because you can't eat the whole cake at once because you suffocate. And so there are some things that we have to do first rather than necessarily trying to do everything. But it's on our radar, and I'm hoping that we'll get to it. But time will tell. So that's, uh, I really appreciate that comment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Michael Gibson. Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Apologies, first of all, my camera's not working, which would probably be a great relief to a lot of people, frankly. <laughs> no um, uh, Firstly, I just wanted to also add to congratulations to Sue on her appointment to House of Lords, which I think is fantastic, yeah, not only for, for Lancaster. Um, and also, just also to say that, um, just to add to what Sue said, really, I just, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with Sue on various things, including the Lancashire Association of Boys and Girls Clubs, where she supported that, and um, with the, some of the work in Lancaster generally, and she's an absolute pleasure and joy to work with. So oh, the, the difference you. you've made has actually been oh, really yeah. significant, and I think really yeah. well illustrated yeah. here. That, that so, matters. Um, Thank you. It, it is making an impact. Thank no, you. you've, you've, it's very easy for me to say, frankly. Um, the um, I think I think one area probably that we we miss a little bit is um, and the, where Lancaster University makes a huge difference, but I, th I think can make an even bigger difference is is the business community. Um, we've seen businesses spin out of Lancaster University, and I probably include ourselves in that because we've got nine Lancaster graduates in, in, in my staff now. But we've seen companies like TNP who moved to Caton Road employ fifty people, and you know transform a building on there, and we've seen relative insight go to 36 staff and massive amounts of investment and funding and grow in Lancaster as a as a data science business and these are really really exciting places to work and employ local people I just wonder whether there's more we can do to try and you know get more businesses to spin out of the university or support the development of uni business at the university possibly in the same way somewhere like Cambridge does um, where there's a huge business community surrounding there that's that's based on the success of um, academic research and um, the ideas and the cleverness of their 
their students and, and academia. So I'd, I'd love to have the depth of pockets that Oxford and Cambridge have. That, that helps enormously, I have to say, and it becomes almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. But you're right. Um, one of the things that we have been looking at is, um, I, I won't bore you, but there are there are um, frameworks by which a university is judged, and the government's not very imaginative about what they call them. So to to, to judge our teaching quality, we're governed by something called the TEF. To judge our research quality, we're governed by something called the REF. And to judge our engagement quality, we're governed by something called the KEF. So we have the REF, TEF and the KEF. And the KEF is about knowledge exchange and it's about the university showing how it engages in terms of its knowledge exchange, which, which might be about skills, it might be about education, entrepreneurship, um, you know, any range of, of opportunities and how we evidence it and how we increase it. So as we go into the next year, this is the first year that the KEF will report back its statistics. And it goes into a ranking system and universities, when it goes into a ranking system, gets competitive. And we have been clustered in something that the government has very imaginatively called Cluster X, which makes us sound like something out of you know, space, quite frankly, meteorite. But Cluster X is a series of universities that are not the very big urban um, Russell Group universities or the very small niche universities, but the ones that are research intensive. And within that group, then what we will be looking at is where we sit in terms of the number of businesses that we spin out, how we're able to help those businesses increase in size. Is there the space for them to move on to middle level premises? Is there the space for them to move on into a multinational state? And those are what are really difficult parts. But we've got another idea, so we're not short of those. If you look at our, our innovation campus, where at the moment we have the Health Innovation One, High One, what we have there is a large amount of space. Now we've got a lot of other projects that I'd love to tell you about, but I can't. But if they're successful, then you'll know what they are. But if they are successful, they will bring in a significant amount of not only funding, but interest into the area. In doing that, we want to be able to encourage businesses that would be supporting these particular investments. I can't say more. I wish I could say more. I'm absolutely bursting with it, but I can't. Um, but we are planning that if that space is there, let's make it an innovation campus rather than just a health innovation campus so that we can explore health developments, data developments, cybersecurity developments, all the areas that the university is particularly strong gives us that opportunity to bring in businesses, but to also skill up the staff and the students who need to operate those businesses. And then working with the city council and the county council, how do we find the premises for them to grow into? And how do we then make sure that they have an offer that means they keep those businesses here and don't transport them off somewhere else? And we don't get the brain drain that we're currently seeing because a significant proportion of our terribly bright students head down into the southeast because that's where they see the opportunities are for them. But I think COVID has given us a beautiful opportunity to change that because a number of people see, actually, you don't need to live in a city to do these jobs. You can do them from much further afield. And I think we're ready to capitalize on, on that and we should capitalize on it. So I think the future is good. Um, whether the government actually lives up to its promises of leveling up and focusing on place, well, you, you can decide whether the government will do that. But the reassurance I can give you is that university is putting itself out there front and centre to make sure that we use our facilitating capability to bring in these industries, to bring in the government and to make sure that the Northwest is not forgotten, which it pretty well has been in the past. I'll tell you how happy I am to hear that. Oh, thank you, Michael. <laughs> and, uh, we're doing our best. Yeah, I, I didn't I, say we'd I, succeed. I, but we're doing I'm, our best. I'm ready when you are. I know. I know people. I know people like Michael and uh, Greenhouse and Jenny Eden who've been on this journey with me as well. Will share that view because I think we've been making this case now for a good yeah. ten years, and uh, the, the fact that it's our... actually starting is fantastic. Well, it's about keeping our own people here as well. 
because our young people grow up and want to go somewhere else. Well, we don't want them to go somewhere else. We want them to stay here. We want them to have their businesses here. We want them to have their families here. We want them to feel the importance of place. And if they do it, they'll bring other people in. And I just think we have got so much to offer, so much by not being a big city. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of like Lancaster in case anyone hadn't noticed. <laughs> Um, good. <laughs> right. um, are there any other questions? I can't see any hands up, so I think... Um... But if there are, John, so if there are any questions that anyone thinks of, please get in touch with Sarah and myself. Um, and, you know, ideas you have, questions you have, things that you think, you know, you need to air that the university needs to know about. We are the community connection for this, so please do use us. We might regret saying that, but please do use us. Um, well, uh, I think we'd uh, certainly Lancaster Vision would like to take you up on that offer. Um, and I think that uh, James is likely to be in touch with Sarah uh, and hopefully to uh, organize a meeting with you. Perfect, perfect. Discuss the future. Uh, so. Right, um, I'd like to thank Sue and Sarah. That was a, a fascinating yeah. uh, story uh, that um, starting back in the uh, in the sixties, um, and um, important that you know you stress that you have uh, stuck to your original principles of um, of the university and uh, and intending to uh, develop on develop them. We uh, we would love to be with you on that journey. Um, so thank you on behalf of uh, Lancaster Civic Society for your talk today. And can I ask you all to show your appreciation in the normal manner? Very kind. Thank you very much. I'd like to unmute yourself to have any effect. <laughs> um, <laughs> or... <laughs> very good. Excellent. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you, Sarah. Um, uh, thank you, the rest of you. Uh, I think 35 is the current participation. 38, uh, 39 got up to. We got to 39, so yeah. there's four <laughs> falling off the uh, twig somewhere, but um, hopefully it's not permanent. Uh, <laughs> that's uh, an excellent number. Uh, thank you all for... Uh, coming out tonight in such an awful day. And... <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you for having you. us. Good night. Thank you.